The history of the modern kilt stretches back to at least the end of the 16th century. The kilt first appeared as the belted plaid or great kilt, a full-length garment whose upper half could be worn as a cloak draped over the shoulder or brought up over the head as a hood. The small kilt or walking kilt, similar to the modern or military kilt, did not develop until the late 17th or early 18th century and is essentially the bottom half of the great kilt. The noun kilt comes from the Scots verb kilt, meaning to tuck up the clothes around the body. The Scots word derives from the Old Norse chalta, meaning lap, fold of a gathered skirt. The belted plaid, braken and phalid, or great plaid phalid more, also known as the great kilt, is likely to have evolved over the course of the 16th century from the earlier brat, or woolen cloak, also known as a plaid, which was worn over a tunic the lean, which was also worn by the Gaelic Irish. This earlier cloak may have been plain in color or in various check or tartan designs, depending on the wealth of the wearer. This earlier fashion of clothing had not changed significantly from that worn by Celtic warriors in Roman times over the course of the 16th century. With the increasing availability of wool, the cloak had grown to such a size that it began to be gathered up and belted. The belted plaid was originally a length of thick woolen cloth made up from two loom widths sewn together to give a total width of 54 to 60 inches, 140 to 150 chem, and up to 7 yards, 6.4 m, in length. This garment was gathered up into pleats and secured by a wide belt. Plaids with belt loops were in use by the 18th century. A surviving men's belted plaid from 1822 has a belt loop sewn inside it at each pattern repeat, such that it can be unpleated entirely into a blanket or rapidly pleated with a hidden drawstring belt with a second belt worn outside to flatten the pleats, as in the portrait of Lord Mungo Murray. Above, the upper half could be worn as a cloak draped over the left shoulder, hung down over the belt and gathered up at the front, or brought up over the shoulders or head for protection against weather. It was worn over a line, a full sleeve tunic stopping below the waist, and could also serve as a camping blanket. A description from 1746 states, The garb is certainly very loose, and fits men inured to it to go through great fatigues, to make very quick marches, to bear out against the inclemency of the weather, to wade through rivers, and shelter in huts, woods, and rocks upon occasion, which men dressed in the low country garb could not possibly endure. For battle, it was customary to take off the plaid beforehand and set it aside, the highland charge being made wearing only the line croich or war shirt, a knee-length shirt of leather, linen or canvas, heavily pleated and sometimes quilted as protection. The exact age of the great kilt is still under debate. Earlier carvings or illustrations prior to the 16th century appearing to show the kilt may show the kilt may show the lean. The earliest written source that definitely describes the belted plaid or great kilt comes from 1594. The great kilt is mostly associated with the Scottish Highlands, but was also used in poor lowlands rural areas. Widespread use of this type of kilt continued into the 19th century, and some still wear it today. Kilt makers who still supply great kilts offer them primarily as highly formal attire, equivalent to white tie evening wear typically paired with a Sheriff Meyer doublet and a ruffled jabot. Sometime in the late 17th or early 18th century, the small kilt Phaleid Beeg, anglicized as Philibeg or Philibeg, using a single width of cloth worn hanging down below the belt, came into use, becoming popular throughout the highlands and northern lowlands by 1746, although the great kilt or belted. Plaid continued to be worn. The small kilt is a development from the great kilt being essentially its bottom half. The tailored kilt was adopted by the Highland regiments of the British Army, and the military kilt and its formalized accessories passed into civilian usage during the early 19th century and have remained popular ever since. The earliest extant example of a tailored kilt is from C. 1796, currently in the possession of the Scottish Tartans Authority. A regimental kilt of the Gordon Highlanders, 92nd Regiment of Foot, from C. 1817 still survives in remarkable condition at the National Army Museum. 
a letter written by Ivan Bailey in 1768 and published in the Edinburgh Magazine in March 1785 states that the garment people would recognize as a kilt today was invented in the 1720s by Thomas Rawlinson, a Quaker from Lancashire. After the Jacobite campaign of 1715, the government opened the highlands to outside exploitation and Rawlinson went into partnership with Ian MacDonnell, chief of the MacDonalds of Glengarry, to manufacture charcoal from the forest near Inverness and smell iron ore there. So the story goes, the belted plaid worn by the Highlanders he employed was too cumbrous and unwieldy. For this work, so, together with the tailor of the regiment stationed at Inverness, Rawlinson produced a kilt which consisted of the lower half of the belted plaid worn as a distinct garment with pleats already sewn. He wore it himself, as did his business partner whose clansmen then followed suit. Major H. R. Duff, 1815, repeated the story in short form as fact in his Culloden papers, and Sir Walter Scott, 1816, agreed with him in a review of the book. David Stewart of Garth, 1825, wrote of the story as being unsubstantiated, and one of the arguments brought forward by some modern authors to prove that the Highland garb is of recent introduction. Some 19th century writers supported the notion of the story, but did not get the details correct. John McCulloch, 1824, remembered the name Rawlinson, but placed the events at a lead mine in Tyndrum, while John Sinclair, 1830, wrote it is well known that the filig was invented by an Englishman, but then got the location and date wrong. A 1914 article in Celtic Review considered that the story not appearing until half a century after the alleged invention was suspicious. Reactions of 20th and 21st century researchers to the Rawlinson story have been mixed. J.G. McKay, 1924, calls it a myth without credence, but one difficult to dispel for having gone so long without a serious attempt to contradict it. He suspects a military politics motivation behind the letter. There was at that time, as on several occasions since, an attempt being made to have the wearing of the Highland dress by the Highland regiments discontinued. And the article in question was written with the intention of discrediting the dress as a national garb. Sir Thomas Innes of Lerney, 1939-1971, calls it a wretched story. Barnes at a wretched story. Barnes v. Kennedy, 1956, say the idea was attributed to Rawlinson without taking a side. Dunbar, 1979, takes the letter at face value, and Trevor Roper, 1983, accepts it without much question, relying on it heavily in a later posthumous volume, 2008. Banks. De La Chapelle, 2007, label the story a legend, accept the location, then suggest that the workers themselves may have invented the short kilt. Pittock 2010 wrote that it is ridiculous to suppose that an English Quaker industrialist could determine the sartorial priorities of a national culture and that the story was characterized by easy vivaments and lack of either rigor or depth. Purser 2020 reports that there is no evidence to support the story in Rawlinson's own copious detailed papers. It has been suggested by Matthew Newsom, 2000, that there is evidence of Highlanders wearing only the bottom part of the belted plaid before this, as early as the 1690s. Innes of Lerney, 1939, cited a 1661 map of Aberdeen by James Gordon of Rothiam A as possibly illustrating a short kilt. Gordon's evidence is not confined to his illustration, for he describes the garment as folded all round the body about the region of the belt. Dunbar, 1979, argued that because the engraver was Dutch, that the outfit represented Dutch costume. He did not address the textual description. Earlier, D.W. Stewart, 1893, also argued for evidence of 17th century use, though the materials he was reading are not very clear, and Dunbar, 1979, argues against his interpretations. McKay, 1924, further suggests Scottish coats of arms published in 1659 and 1673 show supporters in 1659 and 1673 show supporters in small kill. Campbell, 1899, did likewise, as did Innes of Lerney, 1939. Dunbar again offered a conflicting opinion. McKay also quoted C. 1715 Scots Jacobite songs that specifically mentioned the filibeg 
and mid-17th century sources that seem to treat the plaid and kilt as separated garments. J.F. Campbell, 1862, also pointed out such material. A similar passage appears in William Brereton's Travels, written 1634. 35. A 1677 account by one Thomas Kirk of Yorkshire described Scotsmen wearing a sort of breeches not unlike a petticoat, that reaches not so low by far as their knees, with a plaid over the left shoulder and under the right arm. Dunbar, 1979, relying on McClintock, 1943, argues that it is not clear that the petticoat and plaid were separate garments i.a. that the entire getup could have been a belted plaid. Unbar concedes that it is an ambiguous reference that has been furiously debated. McKay, 1924, raised a point of logic. Since the belted plaid was made of two pieces of tartan cloth stitched together to provide the necessary top to bottom span, it is surely too great a strain upon our credulity to ask us to believe that no one before Rawlinson ever thought to use the lower one by itself. All of the above is typical of the long-running debate with different authors, often with unkind words for the opposition, offering their opinions and some evidence, with neither viewpoint clearly having the evidentiary upper hand. Professor and museum curator Hugh Cheap wrote of the dispute. Such a debate has tended to be circular, without adding much more than value judgment to our knowledge of Highland dress. Nonetheless, the kilt of Rawlinson's factory is the earliest documented example with sewn in pleats, a distinctive feature of the kilt worn today. Probably the earliest portrait unambiguously featuring a small kilt is one of Alastair Ruad MacDonnell of Glengarry in a belted plaid and tartan jacket, son of the aforementioned Ian MacDonnell with a retainer in the Donnell with a retainer in the background in the small kilt. The artist is unknown, and the painting is loosely dated to C1747. Dunbar, 1979, argued that the location of Glengarry supported the idea of the small kilt originating there. A characteristic of the Highland clan system was that clansmen felt loyalty only to God, their monarch, and their clan chief. The Jacobite risings demonstrated the dangers to central government of such warrior Highland clans, and as part of a series of measures the government of King George II imposed the Dress Act. In 1746, outlawing men and boys wearing items of Highland dress, including kilts, although an exception was made for the Highland regiments with the intent of suppressing Highland culture. The penalties were severe. Six months imprisonment for the first offense and seven years transportation for the second. The ban remained in effect for 35 years. Thus, with the exception of the army and those who served in it, the kilt went out of use in the Scottish Highlands. But during those years, it became fashionable for Scottish romantics to wear kilts as a form of protest against the ban. This was an age that romanticized primitive peoples, which is how Highlanders were viewed. Most lowlanders had viewed Highlanders with fear before 1745, but many identified with them after their power was broken. The kilt, along with other features of Gaelic culture, had become identified with Jacobitism, and now that this had ceased to be a real danger, it was viewed with romantic nostalgia. Once the ban was lifted in 1782, Highland landowners set up Highland societies with aims including improvements, which others would call the Highland clearances, in promoting the general use of the ancient Highland dress. The Celtic Society of Edinburgh, chaired by Walter Scott, encouraged lowlanders to join this antiquarian enthusiasm. The kilt became identified with the whole of Scotland with the pageantry of the visit of King George IV to Scotland in 1822, even though nine out of ten Scots now lived in the lowlands. Scott and the Highland Societies organized a gathering of the Gale and established entirely new Scottish invented traditions, including lowlanders wearing a stylized version of the traditional garment of the Highlanders. At this time, many other traditions such as clan identification by tartan were developed. Prior to this, tartans were identified with regions, not specific clans. After that point, the kilt gathered momentum as an emblem of Scottish culture as identified by antiquarians, romantics and others, who spent much effort praising the ancient and natural qualities of the kilt. King George IV had appeared in a spectacular kilt, and his successor Queen Victoria dressed her boys in the kilt, widening its appeal. 
the kilt became part of the Scottish national identity and the wider Celtic identity and the wider Celtic identity. From 1624, the independent Highland companies had worn kilts as government troops and with their amalgamation into the Earl of Crawford's Highland Regiment, 43rd, later 42nd, Regiment of Foot in 1739, their small kilt uniform was standarded with a new dark tartan, today known as Black Watch, Government One, Old Campbell, and other names. Their great kilt tartan was different and has been lost. Many Jacobite rebels adopted kilts as an informal uniform, with even their English supporters wearing tartan items during the Jacobite Rising of 1745. In the aftermath of that rebellion, the aftermath of that rebellion, the aftermath of that rebellion, the government decided to form more Highland regiments for the army in order to direct the energies of Gales, that hardy and intrepid race of men. In doing so, they formed effective new army regiments to send to fight in India, North America, and other locations while lowering the possibility of a lowering the possibility of rebellion at home. Army uniforms were exempt from the ban on wearing kilts in the Dress Act, and as a means of identification, the regiments were given different tartans. These regiments opted for the modern kilts for undress uniforms, and while the great kilt remained as dress uniform, this was phased out by the early 19th century. Many Scottish units wore the kilt in combat during the First World War. In particular, the ferocious tactics of the Black Watch led to their acquiring the nickname Ladies from Hell from the German troops that faced them in the trenches. The Highland regiments of the Commonwealth armies entered the Second World War wearing the kilt, but it was rapidly recognized as impractical for modern warfare and in the first year of the war was officially banned as combat dress. Nonetheless, Individual exceptions continued, and it is believed the kilt was last widely worn in action at the evacuation of Dunkirk in May 1940. However, on D-Day, June 1944, Lord Lovat, commander of one Special Service Brigade, was accompanied by his personal piper Bill Millen, who wore a kilt, and played the bagpipes, while German bullets whizzed around him. Captain Ogilvie of the Glider Pilot Regiment, landed in a kilt at Arnhem. The Kearns of Gaelic Ireland wore the long line, or saffron shirt, of ten misinterpreted as a kilt in depictions, which may have had connections with the predecessor of the modern kilt. This tradition has been continued in the pipe bands of the Republic of Ireland's Defense Forces. The kilt is utilized in the modern full-dress uniforms for multiple active Scottish regiments of the British Army who have some affiliation with Scotland, this includes the Royal Regiment of Scotland, Scots Guards, Royal Scots, Dragoon Guards, and many other units.